Good morning and welcome to the 2015 Out and Equal Workplace Summit here in the beautiful city of Dallas, Texas. I know that all of you in this room represent some of the largest companies in the world and have the ability to make a serious impact benefiting equality and opportunity to the tune of 14 million employees. forward to the day that we can be married on Saturday and still protected at work on Monday, no matter what state we live in, and protected in all aspects of life. All of those jobs, all of that economic gain, the happiness, the human potential, the families are created, these are real things. And we can do more than celebrate them. We can create them. We're not asking for full rights and inclusion. We're not petitioning for full rights and inclusion. We have rights. We are claiming our rights as equal Americans. Please welcome to the Out and Equal Workplace Summit, the always brilliant Dr. Vivian Ming. Ah, and the teleprompter says Vivian speaks for eight minutes. Um, yes, F you too, teleprompter. Um, so, when I was uh, very, very early in transition, my son had just been born, and I was walking him down the street in a stroller, getting to be me, you know, for the first year of that experience. And I was walking past some tennis courts, having taken him shopping. And there's two guys, sort of middle-aged guys, hitting a tennis ball back and forth, and as I pass them, one of them calls out, hey, mom, the goods are looking good. And, you know, I'm like, do you know who I am? You know, by the way, as an aside, if you ever find yourself with the gesture and the do you know, nothing smart's going to come out of your mouth after that. So <laughs> just really spare yourself a lot of humiliation and give up at that point. Um, but it's there, and you know, I'm, I'm a theoretical neuroscientist, I'm a, an inventor, there are kids that can hear because of cochlear implants I've invented. There are, are adults and children that are living lives because of the nonprofits and the companies that I founded. Do you know who I, I mean, the goods are looking good. I want to turn around and slap the guy. But I couldn't because I couldn't wipe the goddamn smile off my face. <laughs> I, you know, that's just me being honest. Um, and it's a weird thing, because 
implicit bias yet. Anyone who's ever seen me give a talk before, it says 620 right here, you know, cancel your dinner reservations. <laughs> so, um, so implicit bias is in this truly fascinating phenomenon. One that's sort of risen to a certain degree of prominence recently, but has been part of the psychological and neuroscience literature for a long time. And part of what's fascinating about it is how internalized it is, how validating it is to have someone objectify me, you know, that at least, I mean, two or three times into it and you're pretty much sick of it. But, you know, in that moment it felt good and, and it felt like someone was accepting me for who at least I wanted to be. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two little pieces of research that I've been working on recently. One is truly hot off the presses, um, but the first is based on a story, a story from a man named Jose Zamora. So you may have written, read uh, Jose's story in Huffington Post, the USA News and World Reports, got picked up. So he wrote a blog post that said that, God, this room is like, hey. Um, that said that he had been sending out 100 resumes a week and getting no responses. So Jose drops the S out of his name. And Joe Zamora is getting responses that Jose never would have received. And he says, soon I've got a job. And he wrote about this, Huffington Post picked it up, made the rounds, went viral, and USA News called me and said, what do you think about this? Because you're a world expert. I, I'm not, but I faked it pretty well. So they, um, you know, if you know the literature, and you probably have all heard of this before, you take a resume, identical resume, you put a male or female name at the top, you put a Caucasian versus African American sounding name at the top, and you get all of these different responses. So of course it sounds plausible, but I started thinking, what does it really mean? When someone says, I had to work twice as hard to get where I am, what is, can I actually quantify that? Turned out at the time I got this call, I had this little database of 122 million people. It's very likely virtually everyone in this room is in that database. And what we were doing was with this very nice company uh, called Guild, for which I was at the time their chief scientist, we were trying to take bias out of the hiring process, broadly defined. You're overweighting this university, you're underweighting this gender, guess which one, you're overweighting this skill set. Can we actually collect enough information and get enough insight to do something about that? And it turns out there are genuine insights to be made. So I thought, well, what if I put every single Jose and every single Joe in that database? Real people, people that I can literally name and point to and say they've worked here and they've worked here, and then see what's different about them. Well, it's hard to control. Turns out Jose is slightly more likely than Joe to have an MD. Joe's four times as likely to reach the C-suite. But Apples and oranges, how do I know? Well, like I said, we developed these algorithms that could help us actually quantify the quality of people's work, particularly for engineers, software engineers. So I went down. I picked out almost 7,500 Joes and 5,000 Jose's that were software engineers, where we could say, same quality of work. What does it take for Jose to be equally likely to get a promotion compared to Joe for the same quality of work. And it turns out Jose needs a master's degree or higher compared to Joe with no degree whatsoever. It's called the signaling cost in economic terms. Uh, and you can put a number to that. That's six years worth of tuition. It's six years worth of opportunity cost. And you add that up and Jose just to get the same likelihood of a promotion for the same work has to pay a tax. The tax on being different. And as it turns out, that tax is roughly half a million to a million dollars spread out over the early part of Jose's career. Now, if you're growing up in, I'll refer to my own home, if you're growing up in West Berkeley, 
and people are telling you, yeah, this is great. We're going we're gonna to found this new com company. Um, we're going to build it, and it's going to be high tech, and there'll be jobs for everyone. You're going to think, really, everyone? You don't have to know the actual number of the tax to know that is it actually worth me pursuing a job in the tech industry if this is the cost? We went and did this for women versus men a little more generically. It was a master's versus a bachelor's degree, so it comes about a hundred to $300,000, the tax. Doesn't pave roads, it doesn't build bridges, doesn't pay for defense, it's just heat lost. If you're curious, I did this by region also and by company, so the tax is very different in different companies. I'm not gonna call anyone out. Uh, but some of you do a really good job of, of mitigating the tax and others not so good. Um, but what's important is there's amazing talent in these people, incredible human potential, and they have to burn a piece of that off just to reach the same levels. And why it's relevant here is I've done the other sorts of analyses, and I'll get wonky, it's super linear. So if you are a gay man, there is a tax. And I went into some details. In fact, there's a tax that persists if you were born in an uh, unaccepting community, but moved later in your life. It kind of sticks with you, you internalize it. If you're a lesbian, well, super linear means you don't just pay both, you pay more. So this is the reality. It's just at least the starting point is to say there is a real problem here. We are not making the most out of everyone that we could be, and we really could be. So here's the second piece, which I'm counting up now, is um, <laughs> the second piece, and this is very new, and I'd like to say as of today, being sponsored by the Credit Suisse, the big bank, um, very generously offered to put some money into this research. Uh, what is the economic impact of LGBT entrepreneurs? And by the way, I'd love to expand this to LGBT business, generically speaking. So if there are any companies here that would love to participate in this sort of research, I'd love to talk to you. But focusing on entrepreneurs, easy to define, um, how many jobs do gay and lesbian and transgender, well, here I am, uh, entrepreneurs create in America? How much income do they generate for their local communities? Turns out, it's pretty significant. Over the last 10 years, literally millions of jobs are created by LGB LGBT and various other alphabet entrepreneurs, and no one's recognized this before. And here's my final little takeaway. We then looked at migratory patterns. So many creative people are born somewhere where they recognize the tax will be high and they could move somewhere else later in their life. And to be direct about it, Dallas is one of those cities, at least historically. And people from Dallas have moved to New York and moved to San Francisco so that they could try and fully realize themselves. And some of those people founded companies or added to companies, though I haven't been able to quantify that yet. But of those that founded companies, they created jobs, jobs that could have been back here in Dallas. So over the last 10 years, what we found is that something approaching three and a half million jobs migrated away from inclusive business environments to cities that were willing to respect people for what they could contribute rather than worrying themselves about who they loved. That is the potential of our community to change the world. And it's a potential no one's been able to quantify before. But I would like to encourage so many of the companies here and the rest of you to recognize that there is a real social justice issue here. And I love to celebrate that. But there is a bottom line to recognizing the talent potential of your workforce and to bring them up. 
to foster that, foster fanaticism in everybody. It's something amazing, and I have been going long, and I have been proud to be able to do this fairly unique piece of research. It's kind of not my job in a sense, but the idea that there is someone in this room who could change the world if only they didn't have to pay the tax and to figure out how to communicate to Johnson & Johnson or to Dallas, this is how you do it and this is what's gonna change the world. And then we all participate, we all win. All of those jobs, all of that economic gain, the happiness, the human potential, the families are created, these are real things. And we can do more than celebrate them. We can create them. So thank you very much.